There we go. So why this letter today? You know, bystanders really are the biggest group that we hear from. And while we hear from bystanders in many different relationships to situations where there are concerns or evidence of child sexual abuse, there's one group of bystander that is often more complex and difficult than any others. 7% of our contacts to the helpline in the last year who were specifically reaching out in a, about an adult sexual behaviors identified themselves as the spouse or the partner of the person they were concerned about. Now this doesn't mean that 7% of everyone who calls us is living with someone who may be abusing ch uh, children, but these folks are often in an intimate relationship with someone whose, be whose behaviors most often online worry them. So initially, many of these bystanders begin with, I caught my boyfriend or, or whoever watching child porn. Does this mean he's at risk to abuse children? There may be a question of whether the partner's viewing habits pose a risk to children in their life or to potential future children. But these callers' primary concern at the moment they reach out to us is the discovery that their partner, their beloved, may be viewing child pornography and they're not sure where to turn to. We generally refer to non-offending partners as those partners whose spouse or significant other has been found to be sexually abusing children known to the abuser, most often in a shared caregiving role, both through contact and non-contact means. This situation that we're going to talk about is more about suspicions and discoveries of a partner's illegal internet use, looking up and viewing online child sexual abuse material, child pornography as many know it. And sometimes folks approach this differently and are even more confused about next steps than if they had actually found their partner abusing their child. There tends to be more vagueness, more uncertainty about you know, what to think and what to do. And this situation really illuminates the importance of understanding the difficulty and the importance of understanding the bystander role when the bystander is in an intimate relationship with someone they suspect of looking at online child sexual abuse material or, or even if they've just found evidence that this is indeed the case. We'd like you all to participate in a really quick poll. You should see the poll up on your screen uh, with the question, have you ever had concerns about the viewing practices of someone you know? Go ahead and check one of the answers. All right, I see the answers coming in. That's great. We'll give it just a, another minute or so as folks are checking off. All right, I think we're good. Great, so we're going to close the poll now, but we will take a, a look at those results pretty quickly. So let's get to our letter. So dear Stop It Now Helpline, my boyfriend has had a problem with pornography. Recently, I was looking at his computer history and saw searches for child pornography about a year ago. He says this was a dark time in his life, that he doesn't like that stuff and it was a mistake. He admitted to being molested by his adult cousin when he was younger. Is he a pedophile who will sexually abuse a child? Should I run now or is there a chance he can get help? I'm scared and feel alone because I don't know what to do or who to talk to. So again, this is a real letter with just a few details changed. It was given permission for us to use in our advice column. And as we think about this response together, in this webinar, we're going to tie in some similar calls and emails from folks in very similar positions. And just imagine what a difficult position this person is in. Perhaps there are some out there today in this audience who do know, and we'll see that in the poll results shortly. Our tone in responding will be our signature one of compassion and respect. There are complex decisions to make in this situation, and they're certainly not easy. So we want to provide her with information and supports that will best guide her on her next steps. As we talk today, we'll look at some of the actions available to this letter writer. One certainty that needs to come through in our response is the knowledge and conviction that we have to do all that we can when we know children are being abused. Child pornography is illegal, and we trust that this educated audience understands that and knows that actual viewing is not just a warning sign, but abuse itself. Further, research shows us that 
between 50 to 60 percent of those who watch online illegal child sexual abuse imagery are actually likely to become contact abusers. So for so many reasons, this is really an opportunity for prevention and perhaps intervention. You know, and honestly, we want her to feel like she can't just sit back, that she has to address it, not just collude with it. And we want to help her feel prepared and confident that she can do exactly that. We want to emphasize the importance of action, that her concerns and her boyfriend's behavior are indeed important and deserves a response, a response that's protective. Offering understanding and support and helping a bystander in this position identify action steps really requires understanding how she might be feeling, how she might be reacting, how she's being impacted. So, Micah, let's go ahead and talk now about how someone might be feeling in this situation. Sure. Of course, there are so many difficult emotions people in these situations might be feeling right now. And these emotions, these really internal responses can act as barriers for reaching out for help. First, there's denial. It's so easy to make up excuses for warning signs sometimes, thinking, I'm sure it was just a one-time thing, or he's been under a lot of stress lately, or even perhaps the computer is malfunctioning. Denial can absolutely also take the form of, I shouldn't have been snooping around. I shouldn't even know this. One of the most difficult things anyone can experience is finding out that someone you love is doing something awful. Sometimes we're willing to believe anything else but that this beloved person could be doing something that is illegal or just plain disgusting in our minds. Then there's shame and guilt. These really go hand in hand. Just plain shame that there is even someone in our life that could do such a thing. Perhaps guilt that we hadn't seen the signs that this was happening right under our nose. Shame that we could love someone who could be doing such a thing. What does that say of me if I love a pedophile or if someone, or I love someone who sexually abuses children? Guilt, because now this feels like a horrible secret that we have, and secrets can often make us feel guilty. Many people have children in their lives they know and love and can imagine them as the ones in these pictures. Let's talk about disgust, too. Just plain disgust and horror. Other Helpline callers have shared that they have had a very visceral gut reaction to the accidental viewing of these images, literally becoming physically sick. Even if the images weren't shared, just the, the terms in the search bars really brought on feelings of revulsion. And now imagine if the caller herself was a survivor. This can be incredibly re-traumatizing. And then there's the fear. Fear, many sources of the feeling of fear. Fear that one doesn't really know who they're married to, who they're sleeping with, who they've been in love with. Fear, perhaps, of one's own liability. This is on our family's computer. Could I be in trouble? Fear about what others will think if they find out. Fear about what this means for the relationship long term, for the family. And fear of the system, authorities, and others. We know fear freezes people. Fear makes it hard to think straight, to make plans. And of course, there's anger and, and betrayal. These can go hand in hand. They're a natural response to finding out that someone is keeping a secret, that someone is doing something illegal, something that's harmful and may cause the relationship, family, and others harm. These are very common reactions, and they're normal to feel this way. And then there's worry. Worry that while all this results in worry, there's also just the worry about the safety of one's own children or other children in the family, or again about maybe the possible safety of future children in the works. In fact, this can become the motivator to breaking the barrier and reaching out for help. The need to protect children is sometimes what can move someone from a place of inaction to a place of action, preventive and protective actions. Now, I want to speak just for a moment about the support the helpline offers just in its very existence. And you'll have to excuse if this sounds like a plug, but it's so important when that you have a place to reach out to. The fact that you can find someone to talk to, to run the situation by. As we've seen the wide variety of really uncomfortable potential emotional responses, we can see so easily how isolation plays a part in this. Can you imagine finding out that someone you love may be interested sexually in children? One of our most memorable quotes while from a parent and not from an adult intimate with the offending adult is, it would be easier to tell someone that your son was a murderer than a child sex abuser. 
Our letter writer doesn't know whether she has anyone to talk to, but often when we ask on the helpline if there is someone who is a support, there often isn't anyone, not even just one person. There's a sense that no one else is going through this, has ever gone through it. At the helpline, we know differently, and that immediately helps. This step of this person reaching out is actually quite heroic, speaking the unspeakable for some. Well, let's look at the results of the poll now. And you can see that almost a quarter of you do know somebody, either personally or professionally. And the main reason for sharing this poll really is to help reduce that sense of isolation, whether you are a professional or you're responding from a personal place, showing that if you know someone with warning signs, you are not alone. Sorry, just having a computer error. There we go. All right, Mike, I'm ready. Sure. Yeah, once someone is able to reach out, often the, the big question here is, could this have been just a one-time accident or even just curiosity? You know, some of the things we're often asked is, can I believe him? Can I trust him? Should I stay with him? And another really big one, if the caller has children, is, are my children or our children safe? Our writer has spoken up to her boyfriend, and interestingly enough, it seems like bystanders in this position have often first talked to their boyfriend, their husband, or even their wife, and yes, we have heard those cases as well. It's through these early conversations that our helpline hears about these replies to that initial question of, what's going on here? These are some real reasons we've heard given after this initial conversation, and of course there are many more. You know how we talked earlier about the barrier of denial. These responses can all fuel denial. Could any of these be true? Of course. And they all are they all are still warning signs requiring follow-up steps to help better ensure the safety for everyone. Absolutely. But you can see that it can be confusing and hard to tell what's really true. We want to believe these reasons. We want this not to be true, not to be happening. Strangely though, one of the good things really is, is that there it isn't always necessary to actually know whether something is true in order to respond to it. Absolutely. And then there's this reason, I hope. Boy, I'm really having problems with my... There we go. There's this response. It doesn't hurt anybody. I didn't really touch a child. In some ways, you can almost see this response as some core thinking error in all the other responses. All of the other responses are missing that sense of accountability. Even with accidents, there's often a sense of responsibility. Certainly, the continuing conversation may indicate more of that sense of a, a responsibility, of accountability, and perhaps even concern for the children he may have come across. Our writer's boyfriend's response was that this was a dark time in his life that he doesn't like that stuff and it was a mistake. And he disclosed that he was sexually abused by his adult cousin when he was younger. Again, it's easy to see why it can be easy to be confused, why we're not sure what to believe. Yeah, so let's actually pause on this, catching someone you love involved in behavior that is sexually harming children. And they disclose that they've been sexually abused themselves. As you can well imagine, this can really shift the conversation. You know, as a bystander starting off in fury, they can find themselves sympathetic, and that can even further confuse them. Of course, the truth is, is that we can both be furious with someone and feel sympathy, maybe even empathy for them. While it's true that many offenders report their own history of abuse, physical, sexual, even emotional abuse and neglect, what is also true is that the majority of survivors do not become offenders. Certainly, when we hear that someone has been abused, even as they are being confronted with their own warning signs or offending behavior, our heartstrings are tugged. As they should be, we can have great compassion for a survivor and still hold them accountable. So, while this disclosure can feel like a reason to maybe easily overlook or forgive, and we do want to be empathic to survivors' experiences, it's important that bystanders in this position see that it's possible to be abused and not abuse. So as they think about their responses, they can have this information, especially if they have further talks with their partner. This is an opportunity to also, to also see how a cycle of generational abuse can be stopped. 
Now, again, we recognize that um, this is a pretty informed and educated audience, but as we take you through how we respond to these bystanders and their situations, we can't say enough that a key step of prevention is understanding the facts and definitions. It's important to make sure that we and the folks we care about and the folks we work with do indeed understand what they most often think of as child pornography. So please take a moment, read this definition from the Department of Justice. Now, by defining abuse to our helpline folks and pointing out the, the illegality and potential penalties, we hope to be realistic and honest about what this crime is, helping bystanders realize that they're dealing with a crime. Earlier, we shared that many bystanders in this position asked whether their partner's viewing of online child sexual abuse materials is a warning sign that they are a child abuser. By sharing this definition, pointing out that watching child pornography is a crime scene, bystanders generally get it, that this is more than warning signs, that a child is being abused and a crime is occurring. Right, so this is really our first corrective step, clarifying that this is not a warning sign, this is actual abuse. It really can be harmful to normalize the sexual exploitation of children. We address any questions that can indicate some misunderstanding. While perhaps not so relevant to this particular letter, we often address questions about whether children who take pictures of themselves are being sexually abused. We clarify that children cannot give consent to any sexual behaviors, and they cannot, can't often think ahead in terms of where this image will be in one, two, five, or even ten years. And sometimes we include the point that survivors have shared the difficulty with healing when the line between past and present isn't there. When their abuse situation is continually viewed by strangers, the survivor struggles to reclaim that part of their lives. Understanding more about legal definitions, criminal risk, and the impact on the survivor child and on that child as they become an adult are all part of planning for safety and recognizing the importance of taking action. So our helpline response will focus first, as we said, on education. So in addition to clarifying language and definitions, we want to introduce the idea of using warning signs to help better assess what might be going on. We ask about other warning signs that their partner might be demonstrating that could indicate a risk to harm a child. You'll find our tip sheet, Adults at Risk Behavior Warning Signs, in the handouts. Sometimes looking at these warning signs can help answer the question, could this be a one-time thing? Or are there other things to pay attention to? In the case of our writer, the addiction to adult pornography could be a warning sign. Depression could be a warning sign. We actually don't have a lot of information about any other warning signs here, but we listen and look for information regarding their um, relationships, sexual interactions, and also personal safety and responsibility. Warning signs through observing relationships involves identifying behaviors that indicate someone's difficulty in appropriately understanding social cues, expectations, taboos, boundaries, privacy, etc. There may be concerns about this adult's ability to have other healthy adult relationships, and perhaps this person even gets along better with children, showing limited interest in adult connections, but choosing to spend time mostly with children. Yeah, warning signs in an adult sexual interactions often are seen in how the adult talks about children. Do they make references to children's sexuality? Do they talk about and maybe even demean or glorify children's body parts? There may be inappropriate adult conversation about healthy adult sexual behavior, but in front of kids. Are there sexual fantasies that involve children, and does there seem to be some uncertainty about what's appropriate with youth? Sometimes we're asked about whether watching, quote, barely legal porn sites is a warning sign. This is indeed a slippery slope. Again, we want to pay attention to other warning signs. Does this person show an exclusive interest in barely legal young adults? Are they asking their partner to dress or act like a child or a teen during sexual activity? Is their viewing interfering with other activities? Yes, perhaps someone has some sexual interest in this area, and it's only one of other turn-ons, but there is no evidence of any actual child sexual abuse material being viewed and no other warning signs are noted. And when we're talking about looking at warning signs and personal safety and responsibility, some good things to consider is the presence of other addictive behaviors such as drugs and alcohol. Has this person been known to make poor decisions while misusing drugs or alcohol? 
Do they justify behavior, defend poor choices or harmful acts, or blame others and refuse responsibility for behaviors? And do they minimize hurtful or harmful behaviors when confronted and deny the harmfulness of actions or words despite a clear negative impact? You know, the bottom line with warning signs, while we may not know someone's intention, their history or motivation, is that we can use these warning signs to help us put into words what behaviors and situations are causing us to be suspicious. And of course, we always encourage our helpline audience to trust their gut. So we've talked about the importance of paying attention to boundaries and learning more about warning signs. And now it's time to outline some action steps. The first step really is, it's assessing for safety. This includes identifying supports or allies. As a helpline, only getting short scenarios, we have to recognize that there may be other factors going in into this relationship. As with this letter, we really don't even know if these two people are living together, how dependent they are on each other, or really anything. Everything from physical and emotional safety to considerations like housing, economic, social circles, and family relationships can influence safety. We always ask callers to think about their own safety, recognizing that they themselves are in the best position to assess this. And we ask them to think about their own support network, who they can talk to and who supports them. This can help determine all the other next steps. So one of our helpline's key objectives is to prepare these folks in this bystander role to have these important yet really complex and potentially emotional conversations. And again, safety is a priority and not everyone wants to or can have these conversations. And that is absolutely okay. We want to make sure folks know that. These are choices of actions. Some folks decide to just immediately move out of the relationship and sever all ties. That's also fine. It sets a boundary. It draws a line. These are choices. However, if having a conversation or even a second conversation is a possibility, our Let's Talk guidebook is available as a tool to help someone prepare. We're going to share a little of the guidance from that booklet, but recommend folks take a look at it. It's also in your handouts. We just talked a bit about the importance of an ally, so it's great if there's an ally to prepare and practice for this conversation. And it can be helpful to prepare and think about what you want to say, what the message is that you want to deliver, and how you want to talk about what you learned or saw, and even its impact on you. It's hard to have a fruitful conversation in a moment of rage, like that in the, the immediate instant after discovering abusive behaviors, so having time to, to prepare really helps. Think about what the desired outcome of this discussion would be. Beginning is the hardest. You know, one way to start is to just simply state, care for this person by saying something like, I care about you and that you want them, your children, and other children, your relationship and your family to be safe and healthy. Something like, I care about you and I want to talk about something that may be difficult, but I really do cherish us and our relationship together. What can often be the most challenging is having a conversation that is less accusatory than it is exploratory. Even when there is evidence and it's easy to conclude that one's partner is abusing children through viewing child sexual abuse material, Holding off on blaming, accusatory language, drawing conclusions, or labeling the behavior, all will help the discussion. You know, let's back up for a quick moment. We haven't really answered the question most prominently asked in this email. Is my boyfriend a pedophile? This is not an easy question and certainly not one our helpline can answer. Really, this is a diagnostic question. We know that people look at images of children being abused for sexual gratification for a variety of reasons. A person may meet the pedophilia diagnostic criteria, but never actually abuse a child. Or as we said earlier, there may be other factors present, such as drug and alcohol use. So again, this is why we focus on identifying behaviors without assuming or getting lost in the intention. In fact, one of our primary goals for this bystander and people in similar positions is to emphasize the importance of reaching out for live professional support. For themselves, yes, and also to help them encourage their partner to seek help through counseling and professional support. Before we talk um, a bit more about resources such as counseling, here are some do's and don'ts to help guide a more protective talk. 
of course, you know, no matter how hard we try, it's a really emotional discussion and there probably isn't a perfect way. But these recommendations are to help this conversation feel more honest and helpful. So again, the more specific one is talking about what the person has observed and not so much on what they think the person feels, as that makes it more likely that the conversation will stay focused on the behavior. We don't want to have what feels like a diagnostic or criminal sentencing conversation. It's also okay to say specifically what was found and what was observed, like something like, I found the words children having sex in the search history. It's also okay to ask for more information directly by saying, are you interested in children sexually? If something isn't clear, ask for the clarification. Yeah, and talking about the impact of discovering sexual abuse material on oneself can be really helpful and informative. Think about the traditional communication golden rule many of us have heard of use I instead of you, such as I feel really freaked out and scared. What I found on your computer made me feel so sad and worried about these children instead of you're a monster. This may add new information to the offending adult for their own reflection how their actions are making others feel. It may help them to start thinking about getting help. And it's also helpful to share the realistic concerns of this being a criminal activity. Bystanders can talk about the fact that there are severe penalties for getting caught viewing or having child pornography. Someone found to be viewing child sexual abuse material can use, lose their job, be embarrassed by media coverage, go to jail or prison, and or have to register as a sex offender. Further, it's helpful to point out to them that if they're caught, they're not the only ones who will be hurt if their arrest is made public. They'll hurt their family, their friends, possibly lose their job, and disappoint people who um, trust them. As we emphasize the possibility of getting help, and that help does indeed exist on our helpline, we will also encourage this bystander to share with her boyfriend that other adults have struggled and reached out for help, and that help was available. That there are professional counselors who specialize in helping people with sexual behavior problems, and that this is one of the most protective and responsive steps he can take. So is a promise enough? Just like it's difficult to know whether the reasons are truthful, it's hard to know whether the outcome of the conversation will produce the results the safety of knowing that something like this will never happen again. What if the partner under question does say, I get it and I promise that this was a one-time thing and it will never ever happen again? Yeah, I mean it's really important to remember that this isn't a one-time conversation and that follow-up is going to be essential. Things we want to keep in mind are calls being made to try and find counseling. How about the behavioral warning signs we've gone over? Are those still prominent? If there are other agreed upon steps, have they happened or are they making moves to get there? You know, what we really want to avoid is that no bystander should be in the role of the enforcer. It's one thing to say to one's partner, you know, I care about you and I'd like to support you to find help and to deal with this. But for anyone to feel like they're in the position to constantly check on their partner's online activities, to spy on them, to sneak around and see if they're still looking um, at children or looking up websites online, well, this could be a sign that there's a whole lot of trust issues going on, perhaps a risk of codependency and a whole host of other relationship issues. Couples counseling, in addition to individual counseling, can be helpful for couples that are trying to work this out. And indeed, there are folks trying to figure out whether they can still be in relationship even after this type of discovery. So while it may be difficult to find a couple's counselor skilled in negotiating through this somewhat uncharted ter territory, it's really something to consider. But either way, if someone feels like they have to play watchdog, then this is a warning sign and next steps may be in order. Okay, let's talk about reporting. We acknowledge that for most people finding themselves in this position, reporting is such a difficult decision to make. Often the significant other of the person who is engaged in these abusive behaviors may be worrying about so many practical difficulties right now. Consequences for her boyfriend, someone whom she may still love despite what he's done. We've also heard from other callers who are concerned about consequences for their children. At school and at home without one of their parental figures, 
There's also may, there also may be financial troubles, both from lawyers, from treatment, or even from the impending prospects of a, of a spouse losing a job, the person who may be the primary breadwinner. Even social costs like friends abandoning them or her family being the subject of gossip within her community. No doubt the thought of turning a loved one into the police seems overwhelming, but the thought of not taking action may also be just as unthinkable. There are two possibilities here though. The first is reporting this person's illegal behavior. The second would be reporting the illegal sexual abuse content. To report this person's illegal actions, we'd advise them to contact their local police department to file a report in person. Of course, if there's a cyber crimes division, they'd be the most appropriate contact to get in touch with, but in many local police pre precincts, this may not yet be an option. If the person who is engaging in these abusive online behaviors had children or were displaying other warning signs about boundaries in general or around children specifically, then we would also encourage them to contact Child Protective Services, also called CPS or DCFS in many places. The contact information is different from state to state, but you can always call Child Help to be connected with CPS in your area. This information will also be in your handouts at the end. All right, let's talk about Cyber Tip Line. They're run by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and they take any reports of online crimes against children. This includes an adult asking a child to send nude photos of themselves or an adult sending nude photos of themselves to a child, online enticement of a child for sexual acts, and any URLs with child sexual abuse material. Reports can either be made over the phone or online, and giving identifying information is optional. Reports will then be passed on to the authorities for potential investigation. You know, this is often a really good next step for many callers. You know, they want to help the children involved and make sure they're found and gotten to safety. They're also wrestling with the fact that they may not be ready to report their significant other. Yes, they can choose to report their loved one to cyber tip line or the police. But another really good option is to report any URL addresses they found that contains abusive material. This is still a meaningful action step. Some may even choose to do this together with their partner. All right, there's also um, Immigrations and Customs, Informe Customs Enforcement, commonly known as ICE. Um, they actually have a Homeland Security tip form that you can report any child sexual abuse material to. Um, and finally, let's talk about In Hope. In Hope is an organization that connects international callers or people who think that the material originated in another country with the correct reporting agency. When in doubt though, we encourage other callers to, to report directly to Cyber Tip Line. You'll find these and all the other resources in, on the reporting page in your handout section. Great, thanks Micah. So, Sorry, I went ahead of slides. Um, so let's uh, talk about help now and resources. And as we've noted, the best next step is often is to find professional help. In your handouts, again, is resource guides for adults at risk and also for finding counseling overall. But primarily for referrals to individual therapists, we guide folks to the Association for the Treatment of Sex Abusers, ATSA where they can fill out a form online specifying the type of counseling they're looking for and get some referral email, uh, referrals emailed back to them. Our resource guide on finding counseling generally also provides some tips about looking into insurance and how to select a therapist. It's important that this is specialized help if available in their area. There are even therapists who specialize specifically in online behaviors. If there aren't specialists in the area, then finding a counselor who has some knowledge, some experience in adult sexual behaviors may also provide helpful. There are different models of treatment and just like any counseling, the therapist will work with their client to help both look at motivation and at safety planning. Support and safety planning is key. While it may be difficult to find support, any adult struggling with his or her um, own behaviors will be much more successful in changing harmful behaviors if they have support. So while someone may not be comfortable talking to their mother or best friend about their sexual attraction to children, it's still possible for an adult who's committed to changing his behaviors and not abusing children 
to reach out and let close friends and family members know that they're trying to make some changes in their life. And sometimes it's helpful to have someone caring to check in with. There are also some online resources. These are not to replace in any way live, in-person, specialized counseling, and we're always very clear about that. But they are an option, particularly if live online counseling isn't available. CROGA is an online program to help adults stop viewing illegal online child sexual abuse material. And there's also other online resources, again, that you'll find on our resource pages. Yeah, and for the bystander, unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot of specialized support. Again, individual counseling is important. Having a confidential professional support can really help someone make difficult decisions and take care of themselves. When we're talking about counseling, there's also ATSA that Jenny had mentioned before. Um, this organization, besides um, working with people, giving out referrals for people um, who are concerned about their own sexual behaviors, um, there's also on their referral request page, they have a place where you can check off um, family or spouse of those who offend, which can be helpful in finding a provider that understands some of these specific needs and challenges that spouses and pa partners may come in with. There are also a number of limited online supports. Kroga, again, has a place just for friends and family members to get more information. There's also some peer-led groups, too. For example, there's a website called Daily Strength that has some support forms for partners, people who have sexually abused children. Great. So we're, we're getting ready to wrap up. And we know that many of you out here are professionals. And you may be the bystander to the bystander who is first disclosing their concern. So first off, you might want to become aware of your state's mandated reporting responsibilities. Check in to what your mandate says. If someone tells you that their husband viewed child pornography a few years ago, and they're not, or maybe they're not sure when they viewed, consider if there's children in the house and other risk factors such as violence or drug and alcohol use as you consider safety planning and your next steps. Shame is likely, and that shame really is isolative. Your professional guidance and support can be invaluable at a time like this. We want to make sure that we don't further shame a bystander in this position, but instead support them as next steps are identified. We want to help build self-confidence and a sense of purpose so that preventive actions can be taken. We can't ignore that we've become aware of a crime, and we're often in the first responder role, which is crucial for healing, recovering, uh, recovery, and ongoing prevention planning. So we're coming to the end of our presentation, and we greatly have uh, plenty of time for some questions. Um, so we're going to be looking for the chat at the chat right now to see if anybody has any questions about folks in this bystander position, um, any real life situations that you'd like to share and have us comment on, or, or anything else that's come up. As you're thinking about questions, again, a reminder that there will be an email that goes out afterwards. It, I, I don't want to say within an hour because it takes a while for the recording to load. So look for it at least by tomorrow. Um, there'll be a survey after this, and, and we look forward to your feedback. And we do hope that you'll also um, visit our Dear Stop It Now webpage on the Stop It Now helpline on the Stop It Now website. And notice that our next webinar is coming up um, in early December. We got a quiet group so far out here, Micah. Yeah, I know. Did anyone have any questions about any of the stuff uh, we went over? I'm wondering if anybody has been in the position of having someone disclose to them that they had found evidence on their home computer of a partner watching any online illegal material. Oh, Jenny, we just had a question come in. It I said, see that. Yeah. Do you have any information on adults with porn addictions and the likelihood that they viewed illegal child abuse materials? It's a great question, but I don't actually, I'm not aware of statistics. Doesn't mean that they're not out there. Um, probably because we stay so focused on particularly child sexual abuse, and while we're certainly aware of 
that adults with porn addictions may just find themselves going down that dark hole, we don't really, again, have likelihood statistics. But thanks for your question. You're welcome. We'll just give it another minute to see if anybody's typing, and then I bet this doesn't happen a lot in your world. You'll actually have a free 10 minutes. Oh, good, another question. Um, as a bystander long divorced from a pedophile, how does one find help dealing with the sham? Well, great question, and I'm really sorry that you've had to live through this. And I think really the crux is to not do it alone. Um, that shame is, I, yes, you're right, I read sham, but it's shame. <laughs> Both kind of fit in, actually. Um, shame is just so isolative. And it's one of the things that we know is that when there's someone who does commit a crime, often that person can be really good at kind of distracting and help, um, kind of sharing the guilt and the shame. And it's not ours to, to share. We can't read other people's minds. We don't always know what folks are up to. It is really easy to believe, to want to believe that someone is a good person. And shame is so complicated, and we highly recommend that anybody who's gone through this experience have the support of a trusted professional and hopefully some close family and friends as well who they can feel at ease with to talk about how this has impacted them. We definitely find the more that one can speak up and, and, and talk about their feelings and their experience, and the less um, hurtful inside it has to be. And thanks for asking. M Micah, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I kind of went on and on there. Yeah, um, I guess the one thing, you know, I want to add is just, you know, people, you know, unfortunately, People who sexually abuse children, they look just like you and I, they act just like you and I, you know, they have jobs, they have families, they, you know, are good to their families, they come from a variety of different backgrounds. So the fact that, you know, realizing that it really could be one of any people, any person, and kind of breaking that stigma, I know it can feel really alone at times, but um, like Jenny said, getting professional support, I know that there's a little bit more support out there for mothers of sexually abused children than there is for partners, but we're hoping that, you know, by getting this idea out there, hopefully there will be a bigger web presence, a bigger presence within, you know, the counseling and professional community too, because really, um, you know, partners absolutely deserve the support too. Yeah, and you know, actually, Micah, while we were doing research, I feel like I was finding a lot more questions in different blogs and different, you know, different sources that people go to for support that show that more and more people are asking this question and seeking yeah. support. Yeah. Um, so I think hopefully we'll see more support, more research, more information, more resources that come up in the future. Great. Hey, Joan, um, can you talk about how to respond to kids who may be viewing child pornography online as illegal, but also in a way age appropriate? So kids who are kind of learning about sex ed by watching um, online sexual abuse material. Am I getting that right? You know, I'm going to do my best, Joan, and you clarify yes, okay? <laughs> so it's a great question, and I don't think there's going to be an easy answer in the, in the next couple of minutes. But I think what the most important thing is stay calm. What we know really clearly is that children's sexual behaviors are very different than um, adult sexual behaviors. And curiosity is often guides children into some really dark places. But what it tells us is that there's curiosity. And that means that there's an opportunity for us to talk with children about healthy sexuality and about what they're viewing online and to help them understand the difference between what to expect in a healthy, safe, loving relationship, and what they're watching online, whether it's abusive and how it's criminal and people are being hurt, or whether it's adult behaviors that are like a, a television show that people are acting out, whatever the nature is of what they're viewing, to be able to address that, compare it to, again, that healthy 
um, healthy, I don't want to say standard, but the, the healthy, safe, loving relationship. Yeah. What do you think, Micah? You want to add something? Yeah, I mean, you know, unfortunately, pornography is out there on the internet. Kids are curious, teens are curious, so many children have watched pornography online, and it's likely that some have also watched, you know, quote-unquote child pornography, especially if, like Jenny said, they're curious, it's normal, natural for them to want to know about sex and sexuality, um, and for them to maybe even want to seek out um, images that look like images of their peers, you know, same age peers, um, but yeah, you know, explaining to them how hurtful this is, and again, taking that age-appropriate curiosity and talking about how that can be explored in a safe way. You know, like Jenny said, through books, um, there are websites out there for children and teens. Um, and also, you know, I know this is a little bit difficult with, you know, kids and teens because they're not really able to do that um, good, you know, thinking ahead planning, but sometimes just being real and saying, hey, this is also something that's illegal. You know, I know some, something that comes up as we discussed earlier is even taking pictures of themselves or of a girlfriend, sharing it um, over the web, and really sitting them down and talking to them about the effects that this has on them now, you know, the fact that they can share this with other people, um, and again, offering them other ways to explore that are healthy, that are safe. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and begin to wrap up, give you all a couple of moments to take the survey. And um, thank you so much for your questions and your, your attendance today. This is such an important topic and not one that we talk a whole lot about is how to help bystanders in some really vulnerable positions. So again, thank you so much and thanks for caring about the safety of children. Take good care, everyone.